so great to see all of you here and that the project is alive and well. Uh, we started it and well, I started it with the part of the story I want to tell is that there were always other people involved. And uh, we're going to call out some of those key people along the way, but mostly I want to point to that it's always been a community of people. And that for me personally, having uh, really founded the project and then participated as a full-time person for like nine years and then stepping away, I've been away longer than I was like directly in the project. I've kind of been, I've been kind of like keeping an eye on it from a distance. And um, part of it is the experience of like having, uh, you know, adult children that are they're all the way through school and they're off in life and they're doing great. So it's uh, been really part of the the fun of the whole thing. But I do want to really talk about kind of how it got started, uh, the initial ideas and motivation. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about the, the user, uh, the design for like low cost hardware was in there up front and Matt's here so he can tell me whatever I'm, what I'm missing here. Uh, one of my mystery questions is I'll ask you is like, when did you and I meet in person? I know, I know we, I've got ideas about that. So, um, let's see, where the first slide, okay. So I guess the other thing, oh, so my current uh, position, I'm a principal software engineer at uh, Planet Labs. We're a, a new space company. We basically are a, a data company. We The data that we provide and uh, generate are images of the earth as well as derived data about that, like where are the roads today and uh, stuff like that. I can, uh, I'm not gonna really talk too much about that. I am gonna mention at the end, we've built a couple of really neat radios. We've done, uh, because of a bunch of restrictions having to do with space and various regulations, there's a link to a paper that we've published. It, it is in the slide deck. Uh, so for details about that, it was a 1.5 gigabit per second radio that we downlink the images from, uh, which is its own accomplishment, getting 1.5 gigabits out of a you know three liter CubeSat. Um, and there are uh, roughly about 180 of those CubeSats in orbit right now plus another uh, you know, 20 some odd other uh, satellites that have higher resolution, the SkySats, which have about a, a 50 centimeter resolution. So meanwhile, uh, on to the, the GNU radio story. A clicker. All right, once upon a time. So um, I had been on a, like really the, the backstory is, is at least a little bit important because it's how I how I got here. And one of which is the, it, it goes back for me to like 1993. And there was this introduction to this thing called the clipper chip. And this was a, this was a thing around a, uh, a, a deal put together by AT&T in combination with the National Security Agency. And they created this thing that was gonna be this secure telephone device but the first thing that it did was transmit the key escrow keys in the law enforcement exploitation field of the protocol. And I was like, wow, that seems like not the kind of secure telephone I would want. And, uh, and I was, you know, I'm a background in electrical engineering, but mostly I've always been kind of in the computer science category. And I was kind of scratching my head and thinking, well, this doesn't, the famous last words, this doesn't seem that like a hard of a problem to solve. And I got, uh, started to meet really interesting people. There was a group of people called the Cypherpunks. We were meeting like once a month and had a really great mailing list that's sort of famous for all kinds of crazy business on there. And I, along the way there, I'd met, you know, Whit Diffie and he became a first customer for me and a mentor. And, uh, and then some other people along the way, uh, John Gilmore, who was at Cygnus Solutions, he was a founder there, uh, they provided paid support for, for really like the GNU tool chain primarily. So if you were like a, you know, enterprise customer and you wanted to use those free software tools, but you wanted somebody to call, that was a service that, that they provided. So, uh, so meanwhile, I started building those things. And then I discovered a couple of things through, through a series of like three different companies along the way, which was, this was a thing that I, I wanted to have a secure, you know, I wanted to be able to have a, my own private conversation. You know, but what I really discovered is as a business idea, it was terrible. The vast majority of people do not care. Some of the people who care, you do not want as customers. And at the end of the day, you know, we built two generations of these things. I learned all kinds of things, met interesting people, 
but at the finally it was just kind of like okay this is you know I was not I <laughs> I was one of those stubborn not going to pivot things because there was something I wanted to exist in the world which we did get two generations of them but at the same time like not a really great business plan so meanwhile as I'm like kind of towards the end of that whole story and at the time there were not uh, cell phones were still they weren't like smartphones long long in the future right and and the US situation we originally had like analog basically fm our our cellular analog cellular phones were were fm radios basically and then the next thing that came along was two digital standards one of them was is136 which is for interim interim standard is136 which is a tdma one and then there was is95 which was really the first cdma you know it turned out to eventually be cdma1 and I'd been reading specs on all these things because, I mean, my dream would have been, well, if I was going to really want a way to have a secure telephone, like secure communication, I would really want something I could carry around, not something like that I had built that you had to like plug into the wall with your like plain old telephone service. You remember that? Anybody here remember all that stuff? You know, you, have a, you know, a telephone and a, you know, a cord and all that whole business. So that's was I had built upon that, a gadget that goes between your phone and the wall. And it's very simple, secure, and clear. And it, you'd had a regular kind of just talk. And then if there's somebody on the other end that's got one of the gadgets, you just push the go secure button and comes up and you know does a brings up the modems and does a Diffie Hellman key exchange, and you can confirm the hash of the key and like have a nice conversation. So anyway, I started reading the cellular standards just because why not? And and it came to my attention that in the IS95. The voice privacy feature, which would have been there to like secure one's communications, was uh, was actually had some pretty serious flaws in it. It was basically a stream cipher with a fixed length, a fixed length pattern that just kept repeating. It was I think on the order of forty two bits. It also that this is before the standard is even ratified. That there are papers published about hey this thing's got a problem. And, and it turns out that one of which is these phones, uh, the standard had like a full rate, half rate, quarter rate, one eighth rate, uh, vocoder rate in them. And then they turned off. So they did discontinuous transmission, save power and bandwidth. Well, one of the things if you think about if you're talking and the last thing you're going to tell you is okay, in any talk spurt, then there's silence. So you statistically have known, you have known plain text going into the system. And this thing that just is XORing the thing across. So anyway, there's one paper published and it's like by some, you know, good smart people. And then I later there's another one published that is just like, oh, there's a straight up ciphertext only attack because the forward error correction leaks enough bits that you can go and go figure it all out. So I mean, this is one of those ones where there's a paper, there's smart people wrote it, it says it's broken. But meanwhile, it's still gonna get deployed. And I'm like, well. You know, I, can't we just pull the bits out of the air and make this point really, you know, make it totally explicit? I don't know if the, those of you around earlier, there was, before this time, there was the data encryption standard, and we were using it to protect everything, your banking transactions and all this, and folks were, you know, we were saying, it's perfectly fine, it's perfectly fine, don't worry about a thing, it's perfectly fine. But people who had, you know, done the math, who said, you know, we could, this is brute forceable, and, uh, my my friend John Gilmore went and basically funded the development of this brute force Des Cracker machine that uh, turned out, I mean, I don't know, he invested like $250,000 and hired a smart person to go build it. And it was built out of, uh, you know, gate arrays, uh, kind of those things don't exist anymore, but kind of the intermediate between an ASIC and this thing that's much easier to build. And so they were able to just demonstrate that, you know, for $250,000 and like two engineers for a relatively short period of time, one just regular old person off the street could go build this, this cracker thing. And they published all the, you know, the VHDL to make it and all that good stuff. Uh, anywho, so kind of in the spirit of that, I was like, well, this, this crypto standard is clearly broken and I'm kind of at the end of my road with regard to trying to build secure phones because you know, nobody, nobody really wants them. And, um, and I'm looking at this standard and I go, all right, well, how hard could it be to pull the bits out of the air? That was really my question. So, uh, and I realized if I, you know, I had any sense and that was all I wanted to do, I would have gone and rented a piece of test equipment. 
right? There was clearly somebody's got a piece of test equipment that will, you know, most likely it might not be the primary, you know, output, but there's probably some interface on it that would, you know, give me raw bitstream out of the back of it. But what's the fun of that? I was kind of like in doing secure telephones. If you think about what's in there, there's mostly like a, a you know, a voice encoder and a decoder, and there's like a modem in there, like for you know your old dial-up modem kind of a thing. And there's some crypto, but the crypto is really in one sense, it's gotta be implemented properly, but it's the least amount of the volume of everything. So I, I was um, I was looking at all that and I was like, hmm, well, maybe what I had to do as my next thing, cause I'm done building secure phones is I should just like teach myself digital, digital comms. You know, this is like the next thing. There's a standard that I like learning new things. And I talked to my lovely wife, Cheryl, and she's like, that's really great, but I don't want to be poor while you're doing this. And I was like, oh, she is so smart, you know? So anywho, I'm like, you kind of like, okay. So, but I start kind of shopping around for like, you know, I'm kind of done pretty good at self-teaching myself stuff. Or you find people who know and can help. So I, I started looking for some hardware that would like, well, what do I need? What would I need to start messing around? What's my lab kit look like? And uh I found this hardware. It was some Canadian company that's still in existence. I don't remember their name, but it had like a pretty good size FPGA and it had an RF front end and like the TI DSP and, you know, I kind of everything you needed to go play. And it was about $10,000, which was kind of within my personal discretionary funding for going to go learn something, whole whole new thing. You know, I, I could do that, you know, it's, you know, shorter and cheaper than going to grad school. Right. And then, uh, then there was this little snafu along the way, which was, it was gonna take $70,000 with a software licenses to turn it all on. And I was like, not within my personal discretionary budget. So along the way, so along the way I'm like, okay, well, I don't know. And then, and then along the way I go have dinner with my friend, John Gilmore. It was just a social dinner, no, no agenda, just gonna go, hey, hey, we're at a Thai restaurant, we're talking. And I'm about, I told him basically this story. He knew about the, stuff but i told him about finding this hardware and that it was like seventy thousand dollars worth of software license and he's like well why don't why don't we create a free software project and you should just make me a proposal for funding and i was like oh really and i'm like okay that was easy and uh gilmore had been a customer of mine in the secure phones he he, he knew me for many years knew my sort of capacity let's put it that way you know seen me work before so uh it turns out that, you know, we found a, I mean, he introduced me to Richard Stallman, who is the founder of the Free Software Foundation and the GNU project. So we have, so we're begun with zero and uh, we're now officially a GNU project. And, um, and we find a, you know, donor directed charity that Gilmore can send the money through. And uh, it was truly the best arrangement I've ever had. It was classic patron that it was like took one phone call a month to keep the money coming. I was not being, you know, was not was trying to keep it really easy. You don't have to keep track of your hours or anything. Just, you know, go to work. I, you know, we'll talk every now and then. And so I started out with, um, well, what hardware can my, can I actually buy right now? And it was like a, this measurement computing. Hello, National Instruments. Uh, measurement computing MC4020. It was a PCI card, not a PCIe card, but a PCI card. It was like a four channel uh, A to D thing, but you could run it at single channel at 20 mega samples, which is like, seems like enough, but that was at least burning up 30% of the total bus bandwidth to run it that fast. And, uh, but now you need something to put on the front of this thing. Like, where am I gonna get my signals? So kind of a little shopping around, you find that there's eval kits for these cable TV tuner. It's a cable modem, KB, uh, tuner box, a little can, it's got an F connector on one side and a little, you know, spy interface into it on one. And it had you know, a relatively low uh, IF output of like the channel spacing on US television stations is the six, six megahertz. It was on the order of like in the six and a half megahertz range. So low IF. So at this point you got enough to actually capture the FM band and television signals. So first thing built is like the FM receiver. And um, the other part to just talk about, and so that was kind of the initial hardware that was available. But again, this board cost as much as a PC. This is not something you, you know, it's kind of like 
okay, part of it, I'll buy this, but you know, you, you're not going to want a whole bunch of, and I couldn't transmit. And then there was a part about, well, where do we, where, is there software around that we can use as a starting point? And um, well, took a look around, read some papers, found this project called P Spectra at MIT. Now, um, actually, uh, hang on one second, let me just get my water here. In the staying hydrated mode here. Um, so P Spectra, turns out to have been kind of quite interesting. There are at least five or six people that got their PhDs by working on this code and through this code and writing it. One of them was like Van Bose and there were some other people. Turns out that down, down the road, I did meet their advisor, you know, and I was like, oh. And uh, so we built, uh, I, we were pretty much, you know, I there were some examples in there, learned, learned some tricks that are still in the Goodyear Radio code base. Like one of the things was the, uh, the frequency shifting FIR filter, which was a thing that you, in software, you do very differently than you would ever normally do it in hardware or in an analog equivalent. It was a computationally more efficient. And uh, and uh, then what happened along the way, so we kind of get the FM receiver going. And then Gilmore is like also co-founder of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And at the time, uh, the US was on this transition between the analog television that it's had forever to this digital new digital standard that it was going to you know, there was a full specification for it. it was called ATSC the advanced television TSC who knows but uh, but anyway it was uh, kind of odd an odd thing but from a from a learning your digital comms universe it was pretty handy because it kind of had one or two of everything you ever wanted to build like two kinds of forward error correction in there some kind of like a kind of a non-standardish kind of a you know uh, modulation scheme in it um, a whole a whole bunch of things and that at the same time the thing to know is that the that in the US that the unlike the cellular networks right who basically that was all done by auction where literally, literally the operators paid billions of dollars for access to spectrum that in the television stuff was kind of grandfathered in with a simple license, like a, a fee that was paid annually. And it was on the order of like hundreds of dollars kind of a thing. And it was part of the, you know, public service getting, you know, back in the day when there were three television stations and maybe one UHF station, you know, if you were lucky. So meanwhile, here comes along this new standard, the Motion Picture Association of America wants to like, wants to make sure that they're going to transmit this digital stuff, but they want to and when they proposed that we're going to put this little bit in this protocol that's in this public standard, it was called B, uh, the B bit, one bit in the header. It was like, this is the broadcast flag, which was supposed to say, thou shalt not transmit these bits anywhere. Don't put them on disk, don't do anything. They're, for us, they were, and they, this proposal came out of their copy protection technology working group. So there's kind of this weird conflict is they're getting access to all the spectrum for free, and they're saying they're trying to do the same thing that they did with like DVRs and all of this stuff where, you know, cable modems, all the whole, like, we're going to lock the whole thing down and you can't get access to it except if we say so. No time shifting that whole business. So out of the whole crypto business in the mid 90s, there was uh, all kinds of things happening around like, well, you could, for example, publish books about crypto, including all the explicit algorithms but you could not ship the code outside of the United States. And there were some challenges that came around there and like, I think mean, Phil Karn was involved in it. And then, and then uh, Zimmerman basically worked with the MIT press and they had the whole code of PGP printed out in a very OCR friendly thing with checksums in the column. And they just printed this big thing that you would just go, you know, get a little guillotine to slide this thing in and then just machine feed it into your, into your like OCR machine. So the point was made and settled that software is actually First Amendment protected speech because first, software is a communication between programmers. And secondly, that the machine can execute. You get the compiler in there and you end up with bitstream out of it. 
So pretty much we were going to just use the same idea that, you know, the software is free software. We're going to, so we're going to go build. Gilmore says, let's go build, build an ATSC receiver in software. Now, you know, this is the thing that in 2001 was possible, but it couldn't run in real time. But at the same time, you know, in 2001, Moore's law was in, it was totally doing, it's like every 18 months, your computer gets faster. You don't have to do anything. You just have to wait 18 months and go buy a new one. And it, it was still really, really going to town. So that was the real first, let's go build a, build a complicated piece of software. Anywho, now someplace in this story, Matt Edis, go ahead, Matt, Matt right? Yay, Matt, okay, raises his hand somehow, and we meet, and I know that we've, I know I've met at your office, I know we met in Monterey, I don't know, I assume it was on the mailing list somehow, but we get together, Matt's, you know, has got a back, I'm gonna, gonna tell the Matt story, you know, the short version, but Matt knew a whole lot about signal processing. He was doing like Bluetooth basic design and da, 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 da. And I'm like mostly software guy. And so, but we get together and we go, we, we need hardware, uh, you know? Okay. So this is a conversation about what can we, cause you could go buy hardware again. There were other things available. They're still like in the order of $15,000. So there's a conversation that begins around, Hey, wh what do we need? Wh wh what could we build? And somebody was telling that, the morning was it Derek about the some of the email conversations that happened so I, I don't quite remember them because it was just for me it was like okay let's go figure out what we could build and uh anyhow I, I was looking through some um um uh change logs in the original code when we did a re releases originally, there were they were tarballs and they're still on the Free Software Foundation. If you go to like, you know, software, blah, 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 you can get the whole history of the of these releases. And there was like a user 0.5 release, which was the earliest one I found. And there it looks like in there that we were like, okay, started on that in well, 2003, July 30th of 2003, where there's a comment that says about the FX2 registers. I, that said that finally changed the bit sequence to uh, this SDCC, which is the compiler for the thing. It's an 8051 knockoff, basically. That they're now allocated where they're supposed to be. So there's evidence that we were working on it then. And then I came across this picture that I don't have in the slide deck because I hadn't talked to Matt yet, but it shows us like sweating in Germany at this like chaos computer club conference tr literally 20 years ago. I mean, it was like, in, it was in 2003. There's a picture. I you come come by and see me later. I'll I'll show it to you. And um, so in 2003, there's the beginning of this whole the thing that became the usurp. There was like a usurp zero. There was like prototypes. There was part of it was we we talked to all kinds of people. What could they build this for us? What should we use? US, USB two was a thing when there was like some parts for it. Um, again, feel free to ask questions along the way here. This is could be audience participation if you've got questions. Um, there's other things about like in 2004, you know, there's things like, oh, RX timing problem fixed, you know, okay, great. And then there's evidence in 2004 of August that, you know, there's about copied, you know, common program modified for the time we've got a different GPIF program for the usurp zero and the usurp one. So at this point in 2004, around August, there was the beginning of the, at least the usurp one was being like the first one was being prototyped. Besides the usurp zero, which was just a little tiny board with just SMA connectors on it and no RF. Um, so meanwhile, back to this, the EFF and the the this copy protection technology working group. So we go and make progress on this. And I want to, you know, really Matt taught me a lot of what I know about signal processing. He was uh, actually way better at it than I ever was. And so it was just thank you, Matt. And again, I want to point to that there's just a lot of people involved. I mean, they're just uh, as it as it went on, and that uh, we had we had the other thing working, or it was getting close to working, and that the the Motion Picture Association, the MPAA's Copy Protection Technology Working Group, is having this big gathering about the broadcast flag in Los Angeles, and so the EFF says, okay, will you come with us to this thing and you know talk about what you're doing about the you're going to build this piece of free software, and it's We'll we'll put in the code that will like honor that bit, 
but it's a we're going to publish it so that anybody can do it so you know anybody could just ignore that bit so so we went there and it was all of the kind of consumer electronics companies so there's like Phillips and there's like a CTO and their chief counsel and then there's here's the MPA and their like chief counsel and you know Sony and their chief counsel and Disney and their chief counsel and the EFF folks and me and so we're having fun. And I just kind of tell the story. We're gonna we're gonna build this thing. And there's this bit in there. And we're gonna well, we could we'll write code. We could honor it, but it's pointless because you know we're gonna publish this thing and people are just gonna take it out. And then there was like some folks from some I don't remember, but it was one of the Japanese you know communication companies that was like, oh you 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 must be seventh level analog master to be able to decode the signal. And I was like. Okay, we, we shall see, you know, thank you very much. And so we ended up getting it working. It's still now, you know, in the in the code base, it is still with us. Uh, you know, it's been through many iterations, but it was really the first thing that we built. It was quite complicated, didn't run in real time. I remember that the first thing we did was just be able to capture, you know, point in, and point a log, speaking of yesterday, it's like a log periodic antenna, you know, bought at the like Radio Shack, you know, TV antenna and, and point it at, you know, in Monterey, where I was at the time, there was at least like one or two stations that occasionally were were broadcasting, you know, high def, H, HD uh, at the time, what was HD at the time, signals. And so we could capture and we could capture in real time, you know, couldn't decode in real time. So we had some big files. And I remember it was like Law and Order, some episode from Law and Order. It was like one of the very first shows that was like, you know, in digital native format. Um, it really kind of just went from there. There was like the first usurps, there was building the ATSC, which was a whole lot. There was evidence in here about, oh, so we built the ATSC and this thing that really was a slight modifications of the P spectra code. And I was looking at my, like uh, my first commit that was around in the, uh, regarding this, it was like in 2001, uh, you know, September of 18, it was um, fixed stir length related buffer overrun in P spectra code. And another one was, another piece was return value was off by a factor of, you know, I size of the type. So it was kind of like, okay, this thing, this code had managed to get like five or six, you know, PhDs done, but it was nowhere near what would you call production code. I mean, it, it got its job done and, you know, uh, and it served us because we used, you know, we got it kind of shaped up enough that we could go build this ATS receiver. But given the commitment to actually build a software project that could be used by people who wanted to like learn, one of the whole big pushes for it was a tool that people that wanted to learn about digital comms, like particularly grad students, were could could use this thing and it would be reliable and it would be production quality code. So at this point, I talked to Gilmore. In one sense, we've accomplished this first goal. We did the thing with the with the MPAA, and I'm like, well, you know, this stuff is it was helpful, but in one sense, you know, it was really kind of like grad student wear. It got the job done. It was designed to do, but it was never designed by people who were going to try to support, you know, something that was going to run all the time and not have any errors or you know, seg fault, for example. And uh, I have to say, and then I went to Gilmore, and I was like, okay, I want to start all over again. And I, and I, you know, this is usually the worst thing anybody ever says, like, you know, I want to just start all over. And he was, um, I guess I made my point well enough that he was like, okay, good, fine. Keep, keep going, you know, press on. And uh, so we started, I, at that point, I started building what it was really the thing that you know as GNU Radio. Thank you. And, um, I don't know, we went in there, there's early early references to like the GR, the IO signature is in there and there's like the single threaded for scheduler showing up and it like it first releases and all this whole business. And um, I guess the thing, I just really wanna say that there was different people started showing up. There were people who knew about various things. There were people who were interested. The mailing list at some point, oh, and the other part about this was that we, that uh, then the Gilmore, introduced us, Matt and I, to Jay LaPro, who was a, was a professor at University of Utah and was running this big network test bed that's still in existence. And uh, basically he bridged us, and, and Jay and his whole crew 
were like the wizards of NSF grants because they were running this really big, like, you know, national test bed. And they were willing to like, sure, we'll put some of your gadgets around campus and we'll wire them into our like reconfigurable network. So that was the beginning of all being kind of transitioned into NSF funding for like a few years, you know, and I know, and I'm, I know Matt and I uh, were, do, were funded to do, they couldn't really believe it that, 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 that we got this grant through a really, you know, Jay's and his whole team of people that were like expert grant writers, but they were, Jay was, I remember saying like, I've never seen a thing, a, a proposal that was really just bullet points get, get approved, you know, but we were building something that was needed. It was like this, all of a sudden we're gonna have this low cost hardware. So part of it was like the development of getting a radio and support of support of students and all of this whole business and the, the ongoing building of use groups and getting these developed and along the way, Edis research emerges in some point in there. And so, um, the thing I want to point to is that there's has always been in one way or another, it takes it takes support to make any kind of free software project go. So this it's it's I mean you you could do some things if you have your regular old job and you're just sitting in a corner and you're only doing like two hours every third third day or something. But it's a whole other thing if you can actually bring together some kind of a funding source. Uh, and uh, you know smart people and and people that keep introducing you to other people and. As it went on, that for example, then I got hooked up with some people from Rutgers. It was Ray and Yvonne at Rutgers at WinLab, and they had a they had a giant. They still do again a networking test bed, but theirs was wireless, so they had a whole bunch of usurps put in there and all kinds of stuff. So mostly, I want to just point to community um, funding somehow, so that the the key developers figured out some way that they were going to get funding. It wasn't all through NSF. Some of the people, Jonathan Corrigan, who's not here, but he was doing training on GNU Radio. And I was like, wow, brilliant. He was, he was, he, I think he was making more money than any of us at the time on delivering, you know, training to various customers. And I think he had bundled usurps in it on some kind of a deal, which made his training very uh, useful because it, I don't know, dodged some accounting thing for those customers. Um, Anywho, and then it's at about um, about 2009, uh, well, 2010, that I really kind of had my full of doing this as a full-time job. And I had met Tom Rondeau, who I, rumor has that he's going to be here today sometime. Anybody back in the corner? No, not yet. No sign of him yet. But I'd met him somehow on the mailing list and had gone to Virginia Tech where he was finishing up his PhD and we talked and he was like, great, he's perfect. He actually has a PhD in like, you know, like digital comms or, you know. And uh, so I, I basically picked him as in one sense, my hand successor. And so it went from me running it for the project for like nine years and effectively in this like, you know, the benevolent dictator kind of a position to Tom. And then at that point, he got smarter. First of all, he was part of the people that wanted a conference. I was just like, that's really great. I have no bandwidth to even think about that. So there was a part about just keeping the hand it off. So this is kind of the end of my personal direct involvement in it. But what grew out of this is the handoff is like there was Tom and then there's the people after Tom and then there's like a foundation and then there's how do we organize a conference and, you know, keep participation going. And, you know, I think the time I left, we had a couple thousand people mostly on a mailing list because it was like a, at that time, it was like, we'd ask people to like, go search the mailing list, then ask your question, you know, and if you have you, you know, let me Google that for you, because kind of a thing, because it wasn't totally self, you know, to, it's about survival, you know, and at, at one point, one of the metrics in the annual reports for the funding from NSF was like, what percentage of the email total traffic on this discussing a new radio list was I doing it? It was like 20%. So it was like a big, really a big part of my time was involved in answering questions for people because they were, I mean, that was part of the whole thing, you know, how to, how to do that. So um, I really kind of want to wrap it up there. There's lots of other stories I could tell, but this is the, the thing I want to just leave you with. It's community, there's support. And again, support comes in all ways. A lot of it is in relationships resources, some of those resources are money, some of those resources are I can get you funding indirectly or go talk to these people or just plain old skill. People have got like, you know, we'd have professors started showing up and they were like, oh, you guys need a whole thing about forward error correction. Right on, go for it. You know, write, write all that up for us, you know, or somebody's going to do OFDM. So like that. And here we got a little bit of time for questions and then I'll be around 
uh, through through Friday uh, Friday evening. Yeah, got a big question in here. Yeah, the point of part of the point of this is you too could build your own free software project. Um, so with with software, you frequently figure out how you should design it when you finish it. Um, so looking back over the past 20 years, yeah. if you could start over now, what, what lessons would you have? Um, I'm, I'm pretty, yeah. Well, I'm actually pretty happy with how it went. I, I, I really am. A part of it is we had that whole first part with P Spectra and we built some things in it. So we had a pretty, it wasn't not like we started from zero experience. And I was pretty happy how it went. It was really the first thing I'd ever coded in C++, and it was also the first thing I'd ever coded in Python. And again, we had uh, another person said, hey, you should put Python in here. We're like, awesome, great, we'll go learn how to Python. Um, the thing I see now is my 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 pitch for my very favorite thing, and I, I've been talking about this everywhere. It's more like a GNU Radio 5.0 thing, thing, but it's this new programming language called Mojo, which you should corner me and talk to me about, but basically it's, built by some folks at a company called Modular. They're really building AI frameworks for executing graphs, computational graphs very, very fast. They are currently like 35,000 times faster than Python, where in their particular benchmarks, they've been running like um, NumPy is only getting about 15x speed up. And they're gonna, they handled all the SIMD numeric stuff and they're gonna do all these GPUs. It looks like a fit for us. They're not building it for us, but it looks like it's a thing that I would, and it solves the problem of you've got Python too slow, easy to use, not multi-threaded really, and then C++. So that was my kind of to the future kind of a look. The other thing I want to do, there's actually one more slide I wanted to tell you because I promised, this is a citation for the high-speed radio um, that we built, this 1.5 gigabit per second. The first link has got to actually, uh, there's a slide deck behind that also. And the second one is, they both go to the same place ultimately, but there's a the paper itself. It, it really is quite detailed, shockingly detailed to me that we gave away all kinds of secrets about how we built this radio. Uh, and um, the short version of it, it was like two watts into the antenna on the spacecraft, but a total of about 40 watts of all the compute and FPGA power to get it done all in the, in the you know CubeSat, it was very dense. So again, thank you very much. I'll be around. Um, question. We have one more question. Yeah, absolutely. I just want to say for anybody that was scared off by the introduction of something like Mojo, it is a superset of Python. And so if you understand Python, it's very, very similar. And so don't be too scared, but it does seem very cool. Yeah, and it's, yeah, it's like strict superset, which is really great. But when we, it, it, just to say a couple more, and then I will shut up and you can corner me and talk about this with me, but there's like, it's once you get into the strict superset part, you can do all kinds of system programming. Like you completely be without the garbage collector. You can do manual memory allocation. Their smallest hello world is 20K, which is like all Mojo, no Python. So it, I don't know, it's, it's the most interesting thing I've seen in the programming languages. You know, Rust is out there. Everybody got to learn Rust, but it's, Rust is you got to tell it everything, tell it everything, tell it everything. And it's unwrap, unwrap, unwrap. It's just not, not, like, not looking like super friendly to me. So, all right, and 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 the other thing, just to kind of into the bridge, which I'm sure you're going to do, there's like a break or something. But the, I'm super happy that the, the rest of this day is about GNU Radio 4.0. I've been kind of like my kind of keeping an eye on. I've been show, showing up on some of the meetings and listening because they were talking about things that I cared about, like the scheduler and how do you do buffering and all of this whole fun stuff. And I'm again super happy that there are people that are now fully engaged trying to build the next the next version of GNU, the new really next version of GNU Radio, like all the modern and C++ and all kinds of crazy business that make it go faster and be more useful. So thank you again.